No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today, I got a legendary interview going on with the man himself, Steve-O, in the building. Steve-O, how you doing, man? I'm very well, thank you. Very, very happy to have you in here, man. I've been a fan since I was a wee testosterone-laid lad. Well, I appreciate that. And it, it, this worked out so great. I was uh, talking to my, you know, my, my business partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, man, we need a podcast guest this week. And, and he says, Adam 22. I'm like, of course, dude, that, that, that would be awesome. And so then I looked up your Instagram. I'm like, no way. And he follows me. So I followed you right back and uh, DM'd you. And then here we are doing, did, doing a double. A double. Did you see the thing that I had DM'd you before? N- no, I don't think oh. I did. All right. So let me lay the scene for you. A couple of or yeah, I guess like two years ago, uh, we started to see the NOS popping up in the rap oh, scene a lot more. Right, okay. So all of a sudden, uh, a bunch of different rappers like Gunna, and I mean, it's, it's been around, obviously, like people who know people who are really into drugs. It's been a pretty common part of the drug user lifestyle sure. for a long time. But all of a sudden, you started to see rappers just walking around, posing with the canister, doing little dances with the canister on top of their head and shit like that. And so I made a whole YouTube video about this trend unfolding. And then, uh, and you were like one of the main reference points where I was like, basically, a lot of us didn't really know much about this shit besides right. that Steve-O had a whole fling with it. Sure. And, and dude, I was completely unaware of that. And had I seen it, I, I'm sure I would have responded. Um, if anyone isn't aware of what you're talking about, NOS being nitrous oxide. Right. Which um, is used by dentists to kind of sedate people during uh, dental procedures. Right. That's the medical grade nitrous oxide. But then they have like crappy uh, car nitrous oxide right to like soup up supercars and then they use it in starbucks to uh, make whipped cream that's why it's called whippets and this is why so many people are able to continue to get their hands on it it's, right it's not like they can just outlaw it because it's used in all kinds of valid forms right right you don't you don't want to inhale the auto stuff <laughs> that the automobile stuff is is uh filled with all kinds of gnarly stuff really um the uh the Starbucks kind that they make the whipped cream with, I, did, I don't think that's medical grade, but it's better. Right. And that's where, where you can get it in every smoke shop. And Right. Yeah, because when did. I was a kid, we would do the, the whippets out the whipped cream can or whatever. Yeah, I used to buy cases of boxes of those uh, whippet cartridges. And um, it was a 24 uh, cartridges per box and like... I think 25 boxes for per case so it was like 600 i've seen rappers blow through a whole box like recording a verse oh yeah like a a, a two minute verse that takes them 20 minutes to record and by the end of it the whole box is gone and that's when i realized like oh yeah this is a real problem right for for, dude for sure I, i i would do my best to not even inhale air you know mm-hmm. i would have like two of the cartridges things so i'd fill them both up i'd be inhaling one while i was filling the other going back and forth and breathe in nothing but nitrous oxide right and my goal would always be to uh do it until i lost consciousness which is called um fishing where right. you actually like i guess you just starve your brain of enough oxygen that you just fall unconscious how long were you in love with this beautiful woman Ah, man. I mean, the, the, I was introduced to it like as far back as 1993. But it's, it's casual for a while, and then at some point it just becomes this I habitual would, thing. I would go in and out of uh, kind of like, uh, what, what do you call it, phases right. with it. Um, when it got really, really gnarly, would have been... Well, I mean, I guess it got pretty gnarly right when I moved out to California when I first had some money. Right. I would... Uh, I, it, was, it was so crazy. When I moved out here um, and, and could have gotten an apartment, but I, I, I didn't. And it became this uh, competition between me and Chris Pontius, uh, a.k.a. Party Boy from, right. from Jackass. You were the, feeding off each other? Well, we were we had a competition to see who could stay homeless the longest. Ah. 
It was just just for a laugh. You're mostly and staying with girls or sleeping on friends' couches idea. and shit. That was the idea. The the uh, you know the goal was to just find a different girl to stay with every single night. Right. And and never get uh, an apartment. Now they call um, it being hobosexual. <laughs> I like that. It's like a real term. <laughs> Dude, that's a great term. I think. Um, I uh, folded the quickest. I, I had a, a real drug habit, and and it didn't make sense to be like always looking for a place to stay. When you're a drug user, you need a drug den. Yeah, I, I needed a drug den. But so Pontius won that competition by a lot, and and he went on to record MTV Cribs out of his car. Wow! Like he was like, dude, it was the funniest Cribs segment ever. He says. Uh, he says, I hang this uh, this cross by my mirror, not because I'm religious, but because it it's a deterrent to criminals. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> well, yo, okay, so say you were friends with like pretty much the most prominent rapper who was messing with the Nas and presumably hasn't been doing it for a while because he's been locked up for a few months is Gunna. Let's say Gunna was just your homie, like okay. lived next door to you. You talk to him here and there, and you knew that he was fucking with it, and you've seen the other side of things, and you've seen how bad it could get. What would you say to like your actual friend if you saw them fucking around with that shit? Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, I um, I, I'm a sober guy, so like, I I, I um, kind of live in this this twelve step community. And it's it's not our place to push sobriety on people, mm. you know, like the whole poke someone in the chest and tell them to get the... If you try to push sobriety onto someone, really what you end up doing is pushing them away from it. Mm. So I, I think um, the, the, the message from me and I think uh, in general from sober people is, hey, man... Um, do, you, do, do what you got to do, and I hope it gets real bad, you know, because generally it has to get so bad for anyone to actually, you mm. know, do the do the recovery thing. But, I mean, just, just like the practical advice side of things. Like, I definitely still, I'll let my friends know. If I see them fucking with pills too much or snorting coke or whatever, yeah, I like, mean, no, no, you know. No, right. That t t that's a fair point. I mean, it's not like you say, hey, I love that you're doing drugs. I hope you do more. You know, <laughs> yeah. that, that's not that's not the message. It's just kind of a question of like how you approach them or how to give somebody practical advice. Because a lot like a lot of the young, you know, early 20 year old dudes who I've seen fuck with the Nas, I'm thinking like realistically, they're too young. They probably don't even know about Sivo's story. They don't know about like all the people who've probably had to deal with health issues as a result of this. Yeah, I mean, it definitely will fuck you up, man. Like, um it uh like what, what does it do it reduces your vitamin b12 to a point where uh like it's dangerous for your brain or something like mm. i'm not i um got but then again i mean i would be doing cocaine for three days in a row without sleeping and the whole time trying to breathe no air right <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> 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 so so my my deal got pretty wild where yeah. uh, you know getting getting into that second and third day like i i, I had people walking through walls i had you know I, I, my apartment was filled with people who were never actually there right you know i was like hallucinating some some wild stuff. So, um, so what was rock bottom like for that? Was that part of everything where you kind of had to like quit all this shit sort of at once? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't even. All the hallucinating was like my favorite, dude. I loved it, man. Mm. Like, I absolutely loved it. The the I I, I was would hear voices. I would uh, just see all this cool stuff happen, like. I, I just remember just all these experiences so fondly. I remember um, being in this this chair, and just all of a sudden the chair just bursts into flames. But I'm not getting burned, and I'm just like, "Whoa, this is so cool!" <laughs> like the the curtains would like close and open and close and open. Like all these lights that were never there would be like flashing on and off. Like I had the coolest, raddest hallucinations ever, and and all of it just made me want to just keep. 
just piling more drugs into my body to, right. to keep that happening. You know? Well, I like that you are honest about that, about yeah. just loving that experience. And, and that kind of contextualizes it for people and lets people know why it's hard to get clean when you actually really do love that feeling. I mean, dude, a hundred percent. It was like, a, a like a, a spiritual experience. You know, there were times when, uh, you know, I, like I, I felt strongly that I was like communicating with God, you mm. know, like there was this, like that, like the, like the barriers between our 3d experience, like were eroded and all of this, like, you know, other dimensional spiritual entity stuff was just like creeping in and, and I was hearing voices explaining it all to me. And I, it was just like, I was privy to some other world shit. And, and I, I, I loved that. Yeah. Like my thing for the period of time that I was bad with drugs and alcohol was just drinking, doing coke, and then taking Zans all in like the same night. And then just letting that run like all through the fucking weekend. And it never really got that bad because honestly, as soon as like after a couple of years, once I just really saw it impacting my productivity as like a podcaster and shit, it was kind of easy for me to just be like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm done. This isn't worth it, yeah. you know? So I was kind of lucky in that way. And a lot of times people expect me to have like a more dramatic story about how I got clean. And it's kind of like, nah, at a certain point, it was like I was getting hung over for two days straight and I just wasn't fucking with it. Yeah. And in, in our community, we would say that, uh, they, they, that's like a, a problem drinker as opposed to an alcoholic. Right. You know, like the problem drinker can uh, recognize that there's a problem and, you know, stop altogether or moderate just because they have a good reason to. Right. Whereas the alcoholic just has no control. Right. You know, no, no control, no power to choose. Like, uh, it, you know, that, that's, that's the, the real disease of, of addiction and alcoholism, where you just, you, you're powerless to, to choose not to do it. You right. Know? Like, you, you, uh, you don't even want to do it, and you can't not do it. Yeah, but now I'm at the point where I feel like I, I treat myself so well. Like, I actually act as if I love myself on such wow. a consistent basis, you know? That's a, that's a high bar, man. I think most people don't do that. But, but you don't feel like that? Because I feel like that's the difference between your life now and your life when you were a fucking drug zombie, is that I, you were, when you're doing all these drugs, you're telling yourself you hate yourself and that you want to die, because you know that's the, the outcome yeah. of this in the long run. I mean, I've made incredible progress. There, right. there, there's, there's no doubt. But, I mean, all that negative self-talk, all mm. that, you know, that's, that's real stuff for everybody, I think. You know, Definitely. That, but, like, you know, when you wake up and you eat a fucking salad and you go to the gym and you, you know, like, you go oh, I mean, and re record dude. your podcast, like, you just enriched yourself the whole day. That's right. really, like, the best thing that you probably could have been doing with yourself that day and you chose it. I mean, dude, I, I'm, I, I'm with you 100% on that. And, and uh, you know, I, I look back to, to, to when I was all loaded, just the amount of time that that I squandered, you know, like, uh, so much wasted time, so much, so much wreckage mistakes, like just, it, it, it was a lot, you mm -hmm. know? And, um, then, then I got clean and sober in 2008 and, and it turns into, uh, acting out sexually. And, and, and there's another real time suck, man, like chasing pussy around, dude, like, mm. That's a, that's a lot of work, and then all the stress that, that comes with that, and so. Um, but do you think of that as an addiction, oh, Al yeah. almost exactly like the drug thing, where it basically was fulfilling a similar for role sure. in your brain? Yeah, I mean, dude, like it's been addiction whack-a-mole for me, you know. <laughs> like, and and uh, I had to really address the sex stuff, and then, you know, and then I got really out of control with uh, with sugar, and that's been another sugar and food, you mm. know, like. Um, but so, so every new level of uh, of recovery of sort of sobriety, like it it just it uh, it's like it's sharpening my axe, you know. And, right. and I've gotten to a point where I don't waste any time, you know. All of my time is just straight laser focused on what I want to accomplish. Right. And and uh, it's made me a monster. Mm. Like an absolute fucking monster of productivity. Right. And I, and I love it. So yeah, like, like I've got, I feel largely 
really good about who I am. Um, you know, like, I, I don't put my dick anywhere it doesn't belong. I'm in a committed relationship. I feel really good about that. Right. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm reasonably healthy. Like, I, I do the right thing, and I do the right thing when nobody's watching. Mm. You know, I'm generous to people. Like, I like all, all this stuff, man. Like, I, I get to be who I really want to be. And so, so yeah, I absolutely uh, can say that I've made a lot of progress in loving myself. But... <clears throat> There's just always going to be that, like, fuck, why do you, you know, like. Because <laughs> as an addict, you, you learn that this is always going to be a part of you. So you don't ever want to, like, declare victory over it, right? Oh, you can't. Yeah. You, you can't declare victory. But here's the, the, here's the thing. Like, um, if, you know, if anything, the, the disease gets worse and worse because it's not like uh, all, all the, the drugs and alcohol, the, 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 whatever the behavior is, is just a symptom of the disease and what the actual disease is is just this underlying just discomfort in your own skin like this irritability discontent just like constant just discomfort Mm. and and, uh you and that doesn't go away right so it's a motherfucker dude it's a motherfucker and you gotta like kind of deal with it on a daily basis um which sucks but what's rad is that there's any other disease like it literally any other disease when when you suffer from it the best you can hope for is to be restored to as healthy as you were before you suffered from it right whereas with drug addiction and alcoholism when you treat the disease on a daily basis you become a better version of yourself than you were before you suffered from it really? which is pretty killer i mean there's 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 zero question that I'm operating at a higher level that I am. There's no question that I'm an improved version of myself than, than before I had. I, but so you think beating the addiction made you that much better of a person that you could clearly like see that as an attribute? Yeah, I mean, like I, I think uh, absolutely in, in in the whole like scene of of uh recovery you know everything that we do there's so much emphasis on uh, spirituality mm. you know they, they they describe the the disease of uh alcoholism and drug addiction as a, a spiritual malady you know and like the the, the way to like all, all the whole 12 steps things is about is about like uh addressing all the wreckage you've created, righting all the wrongs, you know, like that, that's spirituality right there. Mm. So by uh, turning, by turning all of your uh, attention, uh, you know, all, all, by making it such a priority to clear away the wreckage of your past, to right the wrongs, to, to, to conduct yourself in a way that, that you feel good about by, by doing the right thing. I mean, that, that like makes life a lot, you know, a, a lot easier. 100 percent yeah and on, and then add on top of that all the layer of just not fucking being distracted and wasting all your time and just being focused on accomplishing what you want to do mm. you know I, I like i i spend very little time bogged down with uh like serious guilt and shame for doing the wrong thing because i'm pretty good at avoiding doing the wrong thing right you know Definitely. i mean not to say that i don't fuck up and you know, hurt people's feelings or, or, you know, dude, you know, I mean, I, I still fuck up all the time, but when I do, I'm pretty good about addressing it, right. you know? And how much of like, because once you have that narrative, it's, it's, you kind of realize that this is something that you can kind of sell back to the public, right? Like there are people who want to hear this and that this is inspirational to some people. Do you feel like you're past that or that, is that something that you're still kind of utilizing as, as content? That, uh, it, it's, it's tricky, man. It, it's tricky. And I love that, that you brought that up because, uh, you know, the, like the, the stuff, with the, the stuff that we do as far as like, you know, 12 step work, like it, it kind of needs to stay on the not professional side, mm. you know, because, uh, you know, if I ever like, I can't charge money to go talk about recovery and shit like Interesting. I, I can't because then then my wires are tangled up i'm doing it for the wrong reasons right i, I had a, a 
like I remember a few years ago, there I got booked to um, to do a Q and A about mental health at some university in like Washington State. Right. And when I showed, like, you know, they were paying me, I, I don't know, like fifteen thousand bucks or something to do a Q and A. I was like, yeah, right on. And um, in my experience doing it, like all the questions, I was like, oh, well, I can't really speak to, you know, like this, like, uh, you know, mental illness kind of thing. I don't really know about that. I kind of know about like the addiction thing. So it just turned into me being paid to talk about addiction. And, and I remember after it was done thinking like, man, well, if everything doesn't work out, I could maybe just like get paid to talk. And then I was like, <laughs> no. And, Cause that, 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 that's a slippery slope, man. So, so I like to do, uh, like the, the, the spiritual work, like all that. I like to leave that, you know, just doing it for the sake of, right. You know, not like, just, I don't I, I try to kind of keep, keep, keep everything in a, in its uh, appropriate compartment. Sure. I mean, like I'll never shy away from, from carrying the message of recovery, but I, but I don't professionalize it. It makes sense. Um, can I tell you, I have a really good Steve-O story. Cool. <laughs> I mean, you're not involved in any way, but I was on the beach in uh, Barcelona in, I guess, like 2012. And uh, it was this like, the, they have this crazy party thing on the beach where it's just people are like there all fucking night. They got tents. Everybody's fucked up on drugs and drinking or whatever. And I'm there with my friends. It's like four in the morning. I'm drunk as shit. And I'm walking through this beach thing, right? And this girl just locks eyes with me and she grabs me by the back of the head and she just goes, are you Steve-O? <laughs> and I just look her right in the eyes and I go, Yes. <laughs> and then she turns me so that she can see my back, because I actually have no shirt on at this moment for whatever reason, you know, it's Barcelona in the middle of the summer, and she sees that I don't have a tattoo of my own face on my back, and she said, no, you're not. And that, was, that was the end of that. Now, I always wonder, like, would I have had the heart to actually, like, get involved under the pretense of being somebody else. I don't know. It sounds like you were well on the way. <laughs> <laughs> Cause that's fucked up. I, but yeah. I definitely don't think I would have like realized how fucked up that was at the time. Well, I mean like if, uh, if, if, if you were in Barcelona on the beach and it was like a big party scene, like, yeah, it might've taken me a few days to realize. But in that, that, in that element, like, isn't looking like Steve-O just as good as being Steve-O? Like realistically, Steve-O's probably not in Spain at this time. Like I'm as good as it gets. I, I, I would dare say that you're better looking than Steve-O. Mm. Um, and, well, fame and goes a long way in, this, I, in a society yeah, of ours. You know, I don't sure. think anybody's thinking about our like facial attributes. Dude, it's so funny, man. <laughs> like, uh, I, I, I have someone that that uh, I would like really confide in with, with my, you know, my fears, and stuff. And I'd be like, man, my, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting older, and my my uh, appearance is is deteriorating, man. Like, I feel like. And uh, my buddy says, see, I got news for you, man. You didn't get to where you are because you're a sex symbol. <laughs> <laughs> for real. I mean, how many guys do you really know that you that because every once in a while you meet a dude who you realize that they are good looking enough that it has really significantly impacted their life. Like, like uh, there's this guy, Leo, I know, who's like a, a, a model or something. He was on The uh -huh. Bachelor, The Bachelorette, whatever. And he's, he admitted that when I was on the podcast that, you know, he, he's good looking enough that he's always been able to just get chicks to take care of him. And he's been able yeah. to kind of coast through life in a way as a result. And I'm like, wow, I don't know almost any guys that I've ever heard say anything like that. I mean, that, that, that's a, a slippery slope in and of itself. Yeah. You know, if, if you, uh, yeah, you gotta be careful with that, man. That, that's like, uh, if, um, if, you, if you're extremely wealthy and you've got um, kids and, and you spoil your kids, mm. and then you know, then the next thing you know, your kid's gonna be a pussy and not like uh, not a hustler. No, I think about that all the time. <laughs> yeah, because you have my, kids. I have a two-year-old. Right, she's okay. almost two, and it's like, I don't know, even little things like I, she she sees me ordering Postmates every day, and it's like. I don't want my fucking kid thinking it's normal to just order Postmates every day. I want you to be a cheap fuck like the way I came up. 
Yeah, that's great. Know. I'm just going back and forth with it a little bit. But, um, yeah, all right. So I want to revisit the time period, too, where I first became cognizant of, of Steve-O. I was, like, 13, you know, perfect prime era. How old are you now? 38. Okay, cool. How old are you? I just turned 48. Okay, good. So I'm, like, you know, 12, 13 and I was fucking with CKY before Jackass came out. Sure. So this was very like revelatory of like, holy fuck, this fucking weird skate video that we had been passing around at school and trade, you know, with VHS right. tapes, you'd always have to like, it would be a real thing to let your friends borrow it because you'd right. actually watch this shit two, three times, right? Um, and then Jackass comes out on TV and this was like, all of a sudden this thing that we kind of knew about becomes huge. Everybody in school is excited about it. Everybody's, you know, trying to jump off a building into a bush or like, you know, <laughs> like get in a wheelbarrow and get pushed into a bush or, or something. Sure. Collide with a bush in some way. Um, can we revisit this time period and, and what it was like to have the show come out and become just this fucking massive? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I remember my first time watching the CKY video, and it was after Jackass had already come out on MTV. Oh, so you didn't see yeah, CKY I mean, until then? I mean, dude, I, I never even met Bam until we were filming the second season of Jackass, and it was already a, a, a like historical hit. It was like the, the biggest ratings for any show in that kind of format in the history of MTV. Right. And we had all never been in the same place yet because like by, you know, the nature of the show, it was all just like a hodgepodge of different clips. Right. Um, so, uh, it, you know, and then before that I had gone from like, you know, selling pot to <laughs> being a circus clown. Right. And, uh, you know, and I went, like, I was working in a, in a circus when, um, we, when we filmed the first season. Um, when the show came out, I had been fired from the circus and uh, spent the money that I got. I got, like, no money for the first season. It was less than 1500 bucks that I made for the entire first season Holy shit. of Jackass. And that was gone. And... Uh, I had been living with my sister and she kicked me out of the house. So literally when Jackass hit MTV, um, I was unemployed, homeless and broke. Wow. And, uh, and a star on the biggest show on MTV. And, um, and did you just feel it immediately where everywhere oh you my go, God, yeah. <laughs> everywhere you go, dude, every kid's got to say something to you. Dude, it was, it was intense. The, um, like the there was the, the, the I didn't really do anything spectacular in the first uh, episode. It was the second episode that aired where I swallowed the goldfish and barfed up the the goldfish into a fishbowl. Right. And dude, when that aired, boom, my my life changed so much because like that was October of year two thousand. Mm -hmm. Like fucking you know just about twenty two years ago, and. Back then, there was they, they had the internet, but you couldn't watch videos on the internet. Right, there was yeah. no, like it was like like telephone fucking like modems. Yeah. You know, there was no high speed internet. You couldn't watch. Uh, Even porn was like photos of porn. Yeah. Like there was almost no video on online. Right, I think. you couldn't you couldn't watch videos on the internet, and um, they. Uh, I mean, they had like cable TV and shit, like, um, and and then and that that was it. So the media was not so fragmented. Yeah. And uh, and it, it made a fucking difference, dude. Especially when the show was a hit, like it, it was like everybody knew me overnight. Mm. And um, yeah, dude, like, I, I was in Florida at that time, and um, immediately I found that I was able to like hump hot chicks you know <laughs> like like i like it and, and i mean i could I, I just immediately like fell in love with the like the with, with just fame and all of the like, power the, that the, that, the, that like, gives yeah, you really, i mean it's really the, the power the you know like the 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 
like hot chicks being super into me like people thinking like man this guy's a big deal you know like all mm. of that and like i just took to abusing that power like i think most most anybody would mm. you know i think that the becoming uh like famous on any level it it has growing pains the you know, attendant growing pains you can't sort of have this power bestowed on you and not try to figure out the limits right and not abuse it you know and 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 that manifests in different ways people will have like uh just shitty attitudes they'll be mm. like you know and and i uh you know a acting out with chicks I, I burned a lot of chicks i you know i'd fucking i had my growing pains man i'm really grateful that when i did that there wasn't a video camera in everybody's pocket, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I kind of made it through my growing pains and, uh, you know, then to th through all the addiction stuff and, um, you know, where I'm at today, like, I'm, I'm pretty stoked to not be like a, 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 I mean, I'm a douche, you know, I'm like, I have my own ways of being a douche, but I'm not like, you know, yeah, there's, there's levels bad. to douchery. I, I can completely live with who I am now. Right. I, but but, to, but to, to, to the so that was what kind of what it was like becoming famous overnight. And and I remember thinking too that uh, the way the 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 way my life changed overnight that I had to get the fuck out of Florida. Right. I was like, man, I got like I got to get out of Florida, like uh, and, and move to California, and um, you know, kind kind of to uh to avoid mistreating people who who uh cared about me and who i cared about them and and more to take advantage of the opportunity that all of this represented right and so i i i moved out to california but i remember watching the the cky video i had just taken liquid like like liquid acid we actually had, <laughs> had a dropper we put like drops out of the dropper of liquid acid in our mouth tripping fucking balls my buddy's making a porno movie and in, in, uh, <laughs> in his bedroom he's got his video camera and he's just boning this chick and and uh, I'm waiting for him to get done I mean whatever he's just boning the chick and, and I'm watching the CKY2K on a VHS tape in his living room right and I'm just seeing bam jump off all this stuff and like remember he jumped off like a six-story balcony into a pool and <laughs> that was just too much for me I was like uh I was like, man, it it, it, it made me feel jealous of of him. It made it inspired me, and I was just like, ah. And immediately, I came up with the idea. I was like, I've got to get it put on my stilts. You know, I, like I kept. Like, I was a clown, so I had all my shit in the car. I was like, I'm gonna put on. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk on stilts with my stilt costume on, and I'm gonna throw myself over the railing of a fucking bridge. Uh -huh. like into this uh intracoastal waterway in in florida like uh just that was my natural i had this intense urge to do that because i was so jealous and impressed by bam and so uh, like I, I got to a point i was like all right dude your porno's done dude we gotta fucking go do this and we're just on acid so bad that like my buddy I'm just, i just barged into his room like when you came come on you know and sure enough dude Tripping my fucking face off, my buddy like uh, filmed me throwing myself off this bridge while walking on stilts. <laughs> right, but that's fucking crazy. Cause like, okay, if somebody wanted you to put on some fucking stilts and do something potentially dangerous, jumping into a pool now, it would be like, all right, well, how much am I getting paid, etc. Right? At that time, it was just well, you're, you're just doing it for the love of the the thrill. No, I mean it was always about getting the footage. Right. And uh, I, I don't know that that dynamic's any different because um, when, when it comes to doing stuff like that, I, mean, I, I still have like a crazy to-do list of super fucked up shit. And it's not even a question about what anybody's gonna pay me to do it. It's, it's uh, when I film it and I own the footage, like how much will I be able to exploit the okay, footage? That's so, true, yeah. Like I'm the boss, right? You know, and 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 that's it was kind of like that back then too. What kind of stuff are you thinking about doing at this point? Oh, <laughs> dude, like I've been. Uh, I thought you were past like torturing yourself. Oh no, dude. <laughs> I mean, like what I what I did, uh, what I what I've done, the way that my my whole kind of career ha has evolved, yeah, um. 
to, in 2010, when Jackass 3D came out, I was newly sober and found myself in comedy clubs a lot of the time because going to bars and nightclubs didn't make sense as a sober guy. Mm. And, and uh, I had like this real, you know, pull to, to, to dive into doing stand-up comedy because I was in the comedy clubs all the time. And I did. And then when Jackass 3D came out, I, I began touring comedy clubs, which I did for like 11 fucking years tirelessly and, and, and largely under the radar. Like people didn't know that I was, you know, really doing stand-up comedy like a, as a career. And that was important to you to just sort of grind away at it without to, trying to bring too much attention to yourself? I, I think so, man. I needed to, uh, to develop that craft. I was also kind of self-conscious. I didn't want to say like, I'm doing stand-up comedy because I felt like people would, would, would hate on that. And people did hate on that, but I didn't give up. And, and, and after 11 years of uh, touring comedy clubs, I graduated to theaters. Now, mm. like, now I fucking go around on a tour bus and, and like, I've like, it, it's nuts now, you know? Like, Does, like on a Tuesday night, I got a fucking thousand people in a packed theater. Amazing. Like, uh, and I just, I'm on the tour bus with my buddies. And, and what what's exciting about it is that as my comedy kind of uh, grew and evolved, it became multimedia. At first, it was like, I mean, I just do the act, and then, and then, in post production, I would edit footage in to illustrate the stories I was telling, mm. and then uh, I did that as my last comedy special, which was multimedia. But uh, for the tour I'm on now, there's like a fucking gigantic screen in the theater. And so I'd like tell these stories about this fucked up shit that I wanted to do. And after each bit, I screen the footage. Mm. So, so yeah, man, like I've been doing higher level fucked up shit than ever before. Does that feel like a compromise though? Because then you can't really like modify your, your set because it has to sort of fall in line with these I mean, specific topics. I, I do modify the set within like, uh, those I'll, confines. I'll, 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 I'll kick bits out. Mm. I'll, I'll replace them with 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 new bits. Like uh, you know, and, and, and I, I don't know that. I, I think pretty much any uh, touring comedian is is largely staying to the same. You know, you, you work on the show. You're gonna do the same show, you know. Mm. Like you might deviate a little bit here and there, but it's not any different because I have video, video breaks in my show. Right. But but I've been doing this. This tour is is kind of in its later stages, and I'll tape this uh, a comedy special. Or I'll do a special for this tour, the bucket list tour, and then I'll move on to the next tour, and 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 that's shit's gonna get fucked up then. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Is it? Uh, are you still motivated to spend that much time on the road, or do you feel like you need to find balance in that regard and set aside time to spend at home and shit? Uh, I, see, I love being on the road, especially now. But like when I was in the comedy clubs, it was a fucking nightmare because it was just living Groundhog's Day of just sl fucking trudging through airports and then check into hotel check out of the hotel the fucking radio you know it's just so right. much work no matter how much you love what you're doing having to have that as your everyday existence is will nightmare. challenge it yeah. yeah nightmare dude i've got i've got this new book coming out in september and in the book i say that any comedian who says they love life on the road on the comedy club circuit is either lying or even more mentally ill than I am. <laughs> right. Because at a certain point... It's a miserable fucking existence. You're sleeping in hotels. You're eating the same shitty yeah. fast food or whatever. I right. mean, you're but, getting a very surface level experience of all these amazing places. But then also, once you've been to every American city, it all of a sudden doesn't seem so romantic seeing them yeah. over and over, you know? But, but then... That it's everything changed now that I graduated to theaters, mm. and I can do the, the comedy clubs. You only do shows on the weekends, right? So it's every week is just devoted to one spot, and you're there like Thursday through Sunday. You right. know, same room, like the whole. You know, and like now I, I I'll do a different city every fucking night of the week, and I'm on this magic fucking. The tour bus is just like this magic pad <laughs> that I'm in hanging with my bros on. Right. I bring an editor, I bring my, you know, my fucking tour team, 
and uh, just hanging with my bros, just fucking raising hell, and the it just magically teleports to where I have to do an hour of work. <laughs> it's like I work for an hour, mm. you know, I'm an hour and a half with a meet and greet after. But so. you feel like you're able to be super productive on the Fuck tour bus yeah. with everybody. That's amazing. Fuck yeah, dude, because like I've got, you know, like I'm, I'm doing all my production shit on the road. I got my editor with me. We're filming, we're fucking editing. I got a podcast studio built into the bus. Right. You know, like, but so the one that we have right out here, this is a separate one that's, that's smaller. The, that's the the class B. Ah, so you have multiple mobile podcasts. Yeah, I got the setups. tour bus. Got it. And I've got the the little class B right. van. Wow, that's dope. Yeah, why, why is it so important for you to podcast on the road when everybody else is just setting up studios in buildings? Well, I mean. I can understand the tour bus for sure, but to have that one and be able to just pull up here so that I don't have to drive like 20 yeah. minutes to your spot is it's, pretty impressive. It, yeah, it's, it's crucial. And, and um, I mean, it's, it, I, I launched my podcast, the Wild Ride podcast, and uh, like right when the pandemic shut down, mm. I had no idea the pandemic was coming. Uh, but I was like, finally, I'm going to get on this podcast bandwagon. And it was something I'd resisted because I got so annoyed so many times by the question, will you do my podcast? Mm. You know, like every fucking asshole and their mom has a podcast. <laughs> and like 99% of them have no audience. And no, I don't want to be on your fucking podcast. Not, I don't want to waste an hour of my time talking to nobody mm. so that you can fucking record it. <laughs> you know? And then like the idea of me starting a podcast and being the guy with the annoying, will, will you be on my podcast? It was, just, I had such a visceral fucking, mm. I just didn't want to do that. And I thought, okay, well, it's important that I do it. But if I'm, if I'm going to do this, let me make it convenient for them. Right. You know? Let me, I'll, I'll bring the studio to the guests. Right. And it was just a rad gimmick. It's fun. Like, and, and yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. Dude. What, like, what, what would you describe as your podcasting style? Like how you would prefer the interviews that you do to go? I mean, it feels very free form, but is there an objective in your head that you're trying to get to? I mean, I think that, I think that it's, it, it's, uh, it's about me being entertained, you know, like, I, I really think that that's what it is. Like the 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 experience I have podcasting, there's so much anxiety with having to book a guest every week, mm. you know. And I've got like crazy ambition, you know. Like I I try to hold myself to super high standards. I want to have like epic guests. I want to, you know, like, and so it, it's a a constant fucking state of anxiety trying to book the show. Mm. That's like the miserable part. The actual recording of the podcast is the fun part, you know, and it's such a benefit to like on a weekly basis have conversations with like super fucking impressive, fascinating people, mm. you know, and if I'm fascinated, if I'm uh, engaged in the conversation and really entertained by, you know, by the experience then it follows that the, the, the audience is as well. You ever and, have bad interviews? Sure. Like, I feel like when you interview comedians, it's not that hard or it's kind of hard to have a bad interview because these are people who talk for a living. My, right. my bad interviews are like a rapper who may or may not be under the effects of opioids and he's just sort of quiet as fuck. Right. One word answer, clearly super uncomfortable. Those are the ones that are the duds in my experience. I mean, there, there's going to be bad ones, and, yeah. um, and 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 fortunately, the the digital realm is so democratic. Mm. You know, it's like like shit that sucks just kind of doesn't get traction, and yeah. the shit that kicks ass fucking picks up speed. Yeah. So so like, kind of the good shit rises to the top, and then it becomes kind of like a battle where you want to make your podcast so good that the fans will watch you interview somebody they never right. even heard of right. because people who are at the top of their game somebody like joe rogan right. even andrew schultz right now i feel like andrew schultz could interview a fucking bum off the street and get a million views right now it's like you know joe rogan i'm sure his his smallest episodes are still fucking gigantic I, dude it's insane it, it's joe rogan's even like 
just flexing on it, like rubbing it in. He's like, oh, let me see if I just have a fucking marine biologist. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to wonder, is, is he like just having a laugh? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Because those, that, that's when I kind of like tend to tune out a bit. Sure. Because he's just way more interested in science and nature than me. Right. You know? Did you, uh, did you follow him over to Spotify? I did, although it took a little while, but yeah, because like pretty much when I started doing podcasts, it was like, I think Joe Rogan might have been on episode 300 of his podcast, where I think he's at like damn near 2,000 now. Yeah. And uh, when I started, I was like, I'm going to do what this motherfucker's doing, but I'm going to do it for like underground rappers and underground clothing lines and porn stars and all these weird people I know. So for me, like I've, I felt like up to a certain point, I watched every single Joe Rogan episode. Like I was such a right. student of it. Like I basically learned how to podcast from him a hundred percent. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's insane. Yeah. It, it, it's insane how, uh, you know, Howard Stern, the king of all media. Mm. And then like, and, and, and Howard Stern is so much like of the old school, you know, like mm. the, I, I think that to Howard Stern, the, like the, the entertainment world, it's like, are you in a movie? You know, mm. do you have a TV show? Like, oh, you're, you're a musician or do you have a record, you know, deal? Like all this, like sort of, uh, you know, establishment kind of approach to it. And, and, and for the longest time, Howard didn't get, YouTube. She couldn't say, well, we're going for views, like podcasting, like no respect for podcasting or YouTube or anything digital. And that made me really look down on him as somebody who grew up listening to Howard Stern. And I was like, how do you not understand how right. Joe Rogan doing this for three hours straight about whatever the fuck he wants is just inherently more artistically pure than what you're doing with ads crammed in every five well, seconds and you're introducing are, bits. and When people are paying... A subscription fee and they're doing ads so like it's, be it's better content and it's better uh business-wise because you're not having to do all this other bullshit to pay the bills i mean dude i, I am like a, a super fan of howard stern you know like um i and and i also acknowledge that um i think that he's of the old school and joe rogan is of the new school mm -hmm. and joe rogan that has fucking eclipsed him. And and to be real with you, Joe Rogan is a big inspiration to me still to this day because of the the way he handles his power. Where given all of the fame and all of the opportunities and all the money that anybody could possibly have, he chooses to just basically live a, a fairly ordinary life. You know, obviously right. he just lives in a super nice house and everything, but you could tell that he just does, he chooses to abstain from basically everything that's available to him, which kind of like when we're talking about being young and getting that fame and getting addicted to drugs, obviously he's had a slow build up sure. to this in a lot of ways, yeah. but that to me is very inspiring to like For get sure. that much success and then just stay normal. For sure. And, 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 and I love that. I think that when I look at um, people who get into all the flashy shit, you know, mm. I mean, you're talking all the rappers and everything and all the, like, it's, uh, and, and for me, I look at, at my buddy Bam, you know, like yeah. Bam was, just got so uh, sucked in to the... The appearance of things you know with the limbos and the the you know like he got caught up in the flashy shit mm. and um it's so scary to me when when people get caught up in in flashy shit and then ultimately their shine wears off a little bit and they can't keep up those appearances anymore and then the question becomes how far down how far are they going to go to try to maintain that appearance when it's beyond their means to do so? Mm. And then at what point does something got to give and they're in real trouble? Yeah, that's you know? when I hear people tell me about, oh, I was in the club and I saw this basketball player and he spent a hundred grand in the club right. or whatever. I'm just like, 
I, I just like this is the worst thing right. that I could imagine. Like, sure. and, and shout out to him enjoying his life if that makes him happy for this time being. All power to you, but I just feel like that is the worst thing you could do is to take like actual real amounts of money that could change people's life and just spend it on indulging in yourself right. for the night. For sure, I mean, and, and I, I don't even quite understand like how I've been able to not get caught up in that shit, mm. you know? But like, dude, I, I, I buy my fucking jeans at Target. Really? <laughs> Still? Know? Yeah. I'll buy some $200 jeans, $300 jeans. Dude, like, I, I, I buy my shit at Target. That's <laughs> sick. That's, <laughs> that, that, that's right. And, and I almost think like, dude, like I could be getting it at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like I, I just don't, you know, <laughs> even though now uh, I, I did, I did, um, Order a Tesla. Oh, nice. I, but I got the, 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 whatever, the cheap one. Oh, okay. Yeah, because people are always trying to convince me that I should, like, have more expensive hobbies, like jewelry or cars yeah. or something. Like, I just don't really feel like that's the kind of thing that would make right. me very happy long run. Yeah, dude. It, it, it's nuts, man. Um, how much, so, dude, I, like, I, I know that I'm going to want to ask you about, uh, about this stuff on, uh, on my podcast, but but right. when you say that, uh, did did you see when when I interviewed Lil Xan? Well, I didn't actually see it, but I was I, I was meaning to watch it last night. I mean, whatever, dude. Like, uh, don't trip. You can you can imagine like yeah. what it was, like kind of what it was. No, because I know Lil Xan very well because he was he was basically like a random kid hanging out at my store, and then all of a sudden he's just huge. Right. I uh, got very interested in. Um, in the the Lil Xan story, because of of like just a, I don't know, some like really well put together video about what was going on. Sunny V two, correct? <laughs> yeah, that's a great channel, dude. He's good. Yeah, it's a really good channel. Yeah. Shout out to Sunny V two. He's on a run. He fucking millions and millions of views on yeah. everything he does. Yeah. Yeah, he's. Uh, I remember I watched that and and you played so prominently into that oh, video. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, where where I, I was I was impressed by you kind of moderating the whole deal because he was accusing his sober manager of feeding him drugs, which just didn't make any fucking sense. Like mm. sober people don't feed people drugs. I know his manager, which made that particularly upsetting for me. Right, you know? right, right. I felt that you did a you did a, a very good job of being um, like objective, like not like. You know, like like very, you moderated the situation very fairly. Yeah, you know? thank you. Appreciate and, that. Uh, and and it made me kind of fascinated. And then um, and then out of nowhere, like the the kid reaches out to me. Really? Oh. Wow. I think it was like, and I was like, "Fuck, man, cool, dude. Yeah, let's do it." Right. So so we get him on the on the podcast, and he's like, "Yeah, man, it's great, dude. I've got this." This tour, man, it's almost sold out. Like, and you know, <laughs> that's the one he canceled, <laughs> dude. Like, I, yeah, I mean, dude, this the, the he was talking about this tour being almost sold out, and like, oh, it's gonna just great. Now I'm like in this great place and just got out of rehab and totally sober. I'm gonna get on tour, big success. And like that podcast came out, like, and the next day, it, like yeah. the tours, you know. I mean, yeah. when I talk about loving yourself or like acting in your own best interest, I mean, Zan is just clearly somebody who struggles with that because it's so obvious that he just has to wake up, work on music, and then like tour, do the, do shit for his fans, just like stay on that path. And he just like has always had a hard time staying focused, yeah. man. Yeah, it's gnarly, man. And, and and that's the other thing too is that in in speaking with him on my podcast over the course of that hour. Fucking, I fell in love with the kid. He's a great kid, yeah. I, I, I fell in love with him. I really, uh, you know, rooting for him. I remember, mm. like, at the beginning of every one of my episodes, I, uh, I give it a, uh, I give the episode an adjective, and, and uh, I call that a redeeming. Mm. You know, welcome to a redeeming wild ride. You know, I've got this kid. We're really rooting for him, and uh, it just seems that, that that he's got some more getting in his own way. Right, hundred percent. Okay, I, I have. I wanted to say this. I was always a Ryan Dunn fan, okay. in particular because I grew up riding BMX bikes, and sure. he showed love to it multiple times. Where sure. there was jackass footage of him, either there was like a BMX brand, Little Devil, and yeah. he'd be rocking their shirts and shit. So we thought, 
he fucks with us because we're always looking at skateboarders like they're the coolest motherfuckers and they got all the money and the girls and they're they're the famous ones and then like just to see him fucking with the the culture that meant a lot to us early on yeah on the bmx colliding with trees <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that kind of thing yeah dude i mean ryan was uh I, I it's so notable to me that he was okay with being given the moniker random hero mm. like whereas i have always been such an attention whore i am such like a such a a self-absorbed self-important like just egomaniacal fucking attention-seeking lunatic mm. that if anybody tried to call me random hero i would have lost my fucking mind i would want my credit i would want my name mm. i would want like uh and and dunn just was it's just the opposite of that, that that's what dunn was just so the opposite of that he had just like the the, the ego was oh random hero great like like oh you want to you want to have me in your project and like not even give me any credit like call me random hero like to like as a way of like even making a joke out of how you don't think i deserve credit right and like he was okay with that yeah you know like that kind of spoke a lot to who he was like he was pretty really uh well adjusted not like uh fame hungry ego driven you know right. like he was a, a real ass dude you know? was it hard to keep going with the jackass thing at a certain point because he was such a big part of it um i mean we didn't like um the jackass 3d came out in uh what, october of 2010 right ryan passed away in june of 2011 and there was no more activity with Jackass until 2020. Right. So it was like 10 years. Like, now I don't. Uh, was that more of a natural break, or was that kind of because of? That? I mean, I think there were a lot of factors involved, in, uh, in, and 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 I I was shocked as hell that after there being no activity with Jackass for like 10 fucking years. Like all of a sudden, Knoxville wants to do a fourth movie. Like, mm. huh? <laughs> you know, like that—that that caught me off guard, man. Because you I, had moved on mentally. You were like, "This I mean, is just a thing that we did in the past, and we I, moved on." I thought that ship had sailed. Yeah, I thought that ship had sailed, and um, I had. Uh, I mean, I've just always been. Even when I was on drugs, I was a fucking hustler, man. I was always like, like I might have been going the wrong direction. I might have been. <clears throat> but I was always moving. Right. You know, I was always doing something. And um, <clears throat> for that whole 10 years, I, you know, I dove into the YouTube thing. Right. You know? Like I, I got on that, on that, uh, that, that digital hustle. And um, so I felt pretty comfortable that I was building my own momentum. I was, I had my own stuff going and like I kind of was going to be fine either way. Right. When the idea for a fourth Jackass movie came up, like it was a no-brainer for me because I, uh, you know, I, I'd never stopped doing fucked up shit. Mm. You know, I, I was pushing myself on my own. For I, sure. I was, there, there were even emails going around over those th those years. You know, like one of the guys would be like, "Hey, come on, let's make another movie," and I and I would reply like, "Yeah, man, fuck, I'd rather make a movie than a stupid fucking YouTube video." <laughs> but but it, it's one or the other. I don't care. But does it really feel like that? Because the thing with YouTube is you have complete control. You can do whatever right. the fuck you want. The movie thing, there's a million people involved. Right. A million. Dead. Yeah. Hundred percent. And 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 here's what's crazy. In it was 2013, you know, like Jackass came out in year 2000. And 13 years later, I still had not learned how to properly edit footage on a computer. Mm. You know, like I was just a, a, a slave to the establishment. You know, if I was in a movie or a TV show, it was because some fucking asshole in a, in a suit in a boardroom said that was okay. You know, like I was, I was talent. You know, I had no like hand in in uh, in in the production of shit. And um, I, I I remember in 2013, Knoxville was making the Bad Grandpa movie, and uh, 
God, that's fucking stung, dude. Because it was like Jackass presents Bad Grandpa. It's the new Jackass movie. Right. And we're not in it. Yeah. Like it was like, dude, Knoxville Timberlake'd us. <laughs> you know? He Beyonce, do you? <laughs> yeah. And now I'm the Jackson Four. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and that was a tough one, man. And um, you know, there was some other shit going on that year too. Like I, I uh, had got fired from. Uh, from, from the one TV gig I had. And, uh, you know, I was still new doing the comedy. Like, I was, I was hardly killing it as right. a stand-up comedian. So I just kind of felt like I was done for. Mm. And um, this uh, this guy, this this, this uh, guy called a meeting for me. Uh, he says he wants to, to manage me. I go into this meeting, and the guy's like, dude, it's all about the digital space. You got to have a YouTube channel. You got to have a podcast. You got to be fucking posting on social media all the time. And and, uh, and I was like, okay. Like, I was trying to com- kind of compute what the dude was saying. And it sounded like I should be making all this YouTube content and podcasts, like myself. He never mentioned one fucking thing that he was going to do, this manager guy. Right. Yeah, you, know, you got to have a YouTube. You just, I'm like, so he's telling me to do all this work, create all this content so I can give him 10% of everything, including my touring. Like, nah, it doesn't sound so good. And the bigger problem when, when he made this pitch to me was that <clears throat> I, I had this ego going on. I was like... Hold on a second, dude. I'm a fucking movie star, dude. Like, I've been in three number one movies. Mm. You know, I've had my own TV shows. Now you're telling me to upload, <laughs> you know, like a fucking YouTube video? Right. It felt like such an embarrassing, depressing demotion, you know, back in 2013. It was like so much like swallowing my pride <clears throat> to do that. And then uh, another buddy of mine just talked me into it, taught me how to edit. Mm. And, and, and I got on the YouTube thing in 2013 and dude, it revolutionized. It brought about a rebirth for me right? because I take control. Now, now I don't need fucking permission from some cocksucker in a suit. Right. Now I fucking deliver straight to my own audience. Right. You know? And does that just feel way more important? Like if you had the option of you could have a successful career in movies, but you can't do YouTube or social media, or you can keep, going hard with YouTube and social media <laughs> and you're never going to be in another movie? Um, I mean, yeah, dude. I think, uh, I think having my own ecosystem is where it's at. I agree. You yeah. know, like, and, and like, cause they can't take that from you. Right. You know, and then, I mean, and, unless you're promoting too much gambling shit. <laughs> Shout out to Steve. We'll do it, man. Is that why they got him? Oh, <laughs> Yeah. I don't understand. How, like, I mean, he's promoting the same gambling shit that everybody else is promoting. No, no. Nah, he was promoting the uh, this unregulated offshore. Steak. Uh, I don't the even The same think... shit Drake pro- promotes, right? Or is it, maybe think, he was promoting I, I something think, else. I think it was something, something else called really? Rubet. Oh, Rubet was, the, but Rubet came before Steak, I believe. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even sure. I don't even know. I don't even know. But I, I know it had to do with some gambling shit. Right. You know, and... Uh, <laughs> And it, it's a, it's a fucking that's just man. gnarly. I, I, I like I, yeah, I texted him yesterday. Like, hey man, how, how like how are you doing? I gotta, yeah. I gotta believe he's he's uh, having a tough time. Yeah, I know it's it's been making me think. What would I do if the YouTube channel disappeared and right. I had to? And it's like all you can really think of is all the other social networks. Like maybe I could make TikToks and then like tell people to go watch my interviews on Facebook. I mean, it's it's a rough. Maybe you make an app, right. and then you go super hard on all the app, all, all the other apps, and you try to get people <laughs> to watch the full length shit on your app. I mean, either way, this is just not as good as fucking YouTube, right? Right. I mean, dude, and and and, and like on the subject of people who are caught up in uh, the flashy shit and maintaining the appearance, mm-hmm. you know, like I, 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 right when I met Steve, will do it. I, I was looking at all this spending, and I'm like, <laughs> like. I, I actually got him on my podcast, which which was like a, some unicorn shit because he doesn't do podcasts, mm. you know. And I asked him, I was like, "What? Uh, you know, I, I'm just I'm dying to know is all this spending that you're doing like a strategic, like masterful thing, or are you just out of your mind?" Right. You know. And and his answer was, uh, "I just believe in myself so much that I just go." With, yeah, because I've heard him say shit like that, talking about, oh, my mom is so mad at me that I'm smelling this money. And the thing that goes through my head is like, 
you don't know that this is going to keep going forever. And right. I don't think that, I mean, Steve's a smart guy and he's got all the opportunities in the world. I'm sure that six months or a year from now, his financial state will be fine, that this will just be a temporary hit. But, I mean, to me, when I see him buying everybody $60,000 watches, I'm like, bro, do you know how much fucking college that's paying for for my kid? You know how much right. that, that, that's a lot of fucking mortgage payments, dude. Like, you can't right. just, like, treat your life like a joke like that. You have to prepare for what's to come. I know, dude. It's so nice. And, and I even, like, when, when I was on the podcast with them, I felt like I was, like, uh, taking a like a big brother role. Trying yeah. to be like, you know, hey, man, I, would, like, I want you to, to look into your future and, and set yourself up. 100%. Dude, gnarly. One more thing I wanted to ask you about. I was watching a YouTube video the other day, and it might have been a Sunny V2 video, but I can't remember. But it showed a clip from a roast where Amy Schumer made this like really off-color joke about Ryan Dunn. And it was it was basically being used to demonstrate the, the point, which is that Amy Schumer is very disliked by the public, I guess, at this I, I point. I think I watched that video, too. And uh, that, that was such a controversial joke right. on that roast. And... <clears throat> To be fair, it wasn't a joke about Ryan Dunn at all. Like, this it was, is like, true, yeah. Like, what, what the joke was, was... Uh, <laughs> You're I'm, a piece I'm, of shit. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the joke was, um, hey, I'm sorry that you lost your friend. There was nothing inappropriate about that, you mm -hmm. know? And, you know, like, I was thinking with, like, everyone else, man, why did it have to be Ryan Dunn? Why couldn't it have been Steve-O, you know? Right. So the joke was, like, Steve-O, I wish you were dead. Everyone wishes you were dead. I mean, I don't know, like... That's not, uh, I don't like, I mean, the, what made it so controversial was that, like, my facial expression was just like, yeah. And I think in that video, they're because like, we're used to seeing you laugh at everything, right? And in that video, it was like, Steve was always smiling, so, right. you know, and now, like, you know, I don't know, I, I think, um, it's, it's whatever. I, I don't, uh, I, I don't hold any grudge over that. And, and, and what's the, the, the tragedy of it was that at that time, way back then, I got, I let myself get sucked into like all of the, the negativity that was aimed at Amy Schumer around really? it. Really? Okay. And I even like piped off in, in some interview, I had some shit to say about it. Mm. And uh, it, it, it was fucked up, it wasn't cool. And, and, and I ended up uh, reaching out to Amy Schumer to acknowledge that. You know, to just try to, you know, mm. to, to, to clear that away. And uh, I, I had a great conversation with Amy Schumer about it. I felt that, that uh, you know, we'd, we were good from that point. And I was able to see her rise in her career to the meteoric success that she had and, gen and genuinely feel good about, her, mm. about that for her. Because, okay, at, I had the same reaction when I first saw it, which was like, that's so fucked up. How dare she say something like that? And then I did, I started to double back my mind and I'm like, if this was Dave Chappelle making the same right. joke, for sure. how would I feel? And, and you know what? Uh, Jeffrey Ross on that same fucking roast had a very similar joke. Really? He said, uh, and it was fucking a really good one too. He said, um, you know, hey, uh, like, in, you know, in, in, all, in all seriousness, the, the, the jackass family has suffered a, a, a real tragedy lately. We want to say our hearts go out to them. You know, they've suffered this terrible tragedy. Steve-O has gotten into comedy. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I mean, the, the super similar joke is just that one was just a better joke. Than, than right. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, nobody was mad at him, and uh, so yeah, I don't know. It, it's all, it's all good, dude. Yeah, just because I mean, I you don't want to be the person who's picking out fights and being selective with their outrage in terms of comedy right. of all things. You want to give everybody the same fair. <laughs> playing field and if somebody really does something that's out of bounds you want to be consistent with your judgment right. about that right you know i just saw like i like some fucking like tiktok or something it's 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 a story in the news cycle right now about how metallica was featured on the show stranger things right and you know they're fucking 
song from 1986 hits the Billboard fucking charts because of Stranger Things. Right. They're they're enjoying this like this re resurgence of you know like just this crazy moment of of attention, and then. Like virtually the next thing that happens is that under all of that, like with all of that attention has come scrutiny and now there's this movement to cancel Metallica because people have unearthed like some legitimately fucking upsetting stuff. But so what did, what did Metallica do back in the day that they're pissed off about? They, they've got like pictures of them doing like Nazi salutes and uh, fucking yeah. like there, there's like some, some I, they're, like whatever it was that was included in this article that I saw. You know, like I, I watched the TikTok of this of this like kind of goth chick like making her whole case for why, you know, Metallica should be canceled, and she she had all these assets to like illustrate her points with like pictures of them doing Nazi salutes and like you know Listen, this and that. And like, I'm so not cool with the Nazi shit, but ain't no purple haired bitch on TikTok gonna tell me nothing about Metallica. I'm sorry. It's just, it's not happening. The ship has sailed. Metallica is cool. Right, Anything I mean, they've done in the past, they are absolved for. I, I, I can't let I mean, this occur. It, my, uh, my feeling about it was that there was, you know, there was some unfortunate images that, you know, it, it, it bummed me out, mm. but what bummed me out way more was the purple haired chick like on this crusade, I thought, you know, like that, that's what cancel culture kind of amounts to is that like uh, everything that you're trying to be against, hatred, you know, like, like races, you know, like all of that oppression, all of that, like, you know, just negativity, you are harnessing and aiming like this is just a woman being racist on Metallica. And I don't, <laughs> you know? but, but I don't think you know, any, like I mean not racist, but but like right. but this this whole this whole like of like uh, just venomous hatred and like like you know it's everything that they're trying to speak out against that they're doing. They're bringing more negativity into the right. world for sure. And and I mean I don't think that there's a chance in hell that this chick actually gives a fuck at all this is content she's playing the algorithm she's playing the game that has been set out she's, <laughs> she's working with the incentives of the social media platforms that I, I, uh, that reward outrage I, i'll give her even less credit she's trying to harm people mm. you know she's trying to harm people and uh and and that and so I, I i don't know i mean like i i, I don't want to see I, i've never been fucking down with any, any shit like that like um I, I don't know. Yeah, Ryan Long told me that when comedians try to cancel each other, that it's like when rappers uh, snitch on each other. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, when I explained to him basically why none of the rappers fuck with 6 9 anymore, he was like, damn, that's like when a comedian tries to cancel somebody on Twitter and then they just show up at the club like it's all good the next day and we're all just giving them the stink eye. I'm like, ah, that does sound about wow, right. Wow, dude. Um Dude, yeah, six nine, man. Like, like let's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's... we might have to talk about that on your show. <laughs> and I could easily, for the record, I could easily go for three hours with Steve, but maybe we'll have to do a part two because we were on a little bit of a time crunch, yeah, and I got to go pop sure. into yours. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. We'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll do that. And by the way, man, thank you so much for making the time for that. Oh that no, was, uh... my pleasure, man. It's a real honor. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool, man. Then then let's let's fucking regroup and jump in the van. Let's do it. Steve-O, I appreciate you so much. And, hey, and, likewise. And if you want to see part two, essentially, of this, make sure you check it out on his channel and subscribe to his channel and everything like that. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Appreciate it. We'll, we'll say the same thing on mine. Appreciate All you, right, man. All right, dude. You. Steve-O, No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, TikTok, Patreon, Instagram. Like, comment, subscribe. Appreciate y'all.